Thank you very much. It's a great delight to hear. I've just been speaking with a Brit who, who knows my background, who's in this uh, private school setting. And I haven't heard that Prince Charles accent. Splendid weather. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't run into that in Georgia very much. In fact, the language is quite different. So I, I now formally invite you next April, we haven't got the date fixed, so our 19th, we call it theological conference. It's not, it's just a conference. Sounds a bit alarming, theological conference, but it's a, a meeting of strange individuals from all sorts of backgrounds, some who believe in the devil, some who don't, some who believe this, that, and the other, and it's a lot of fun, rather like this conference. So do all come, and in Georgia we say, y'all come. <laughs> and I bet you don't know what the plural of y'all is, do you? All y'all, there you go. <laughs> all y'all come. <laughs> nice. Language is fun. Okay, so I... I sort of backing, uh, uh, um, following up on what Frank was saying, there are many themes in common. We have enormous things in common about the need for restoration, that famous te text in Acts 3.21, that heaven has to retain the Messiah, it says, until the apokatastasis, a beautiful word, apokatastasis, the putting back everything right, everything's gone wrong. It's beautiful, isn't it? The world, you've noticed, is degenerate. It needs to be regenerate. It needs to be wound up again. There's a lot wrong with our world. And so that text promises the restoration of all things. And it ain't going to happen until Jesus comes back, not fully, certainly. So with that in mind, perhaps we can look at the parable of the sower for a few minutes. It's more like straight Bible study, and I've been in a classroom for 30 years doing this, and so this feels like home from home. Uh, theology is often in church a mindless exercise. Mindless, not a lot of thinking. How many bands and guitars and drums did Paul have? when he lectured from the Torah, from the Old Testament, for hours and hours and hours, from morning till dusk, not much. So entertainment has swallowed up. The Jesus is my boyfriend type of song that they sing in some settings isn't really increasing the understanding that the Rabbi Jesus, I think, was very keen on. So the story is told in a, in a Sunday school setting that the Sunday school teacher goes into the class of young folk and he says, what has a bushy tail? In the silence. What has a bushy tail and climbs trees. Still silent. What has a bushy tail, climbs trees, and eats nuts? And one kid would have to put it up his hand. He said, it sounds awfully like a squirrel, but the answer is Jesus Christ. Which is the statement. <laughs> which is what you're supposed to say in Sunday school, you see. <laughs> Somewhat mindless. And there are many such things. I want to tell you that the Rabbi Yeshua was a, an intellectual. And the devil says, there is a devil, and he says, you're not supposed to think, you're just a heart is what counts, the mind doesn't count, it's just a cold doctrinal thing, so you don't need that. Just tell me how to live, how to be a good chap, and Jesus doesn't work quite like that, as I think you'll see from the parable of the soul coming up. So let's look at that. But before we do that, it's really nothing to do with what I want to say. We have a little clip from N.T. Wright that Greg was talking about. This is Bishop Wright, who's really taking many of our themes and, and making them public on a grand scale. And I've, I've mentioned this already, but this does get me into trouble from time to time. Ruth Glethill in the Times ran a piece, oh, six months ago, saying, New Bishop of Durham abolishes heaven and the soul. Now, um, you should never believe what you read in the Times, and especially what you read in the headlines of the Times. Um, but the point is this, you can search from one end of Romans to the other without finding a promise that says the object of the game is to go to heaven when you die. That is not the object of the game. The object of the game is that one day God will make new creation and will give us new bodies to share in that. We have been conned by the 19th century capitulation into a kind of Platonism. You see it in so many of the classic old hymns, including many classic evangelical hymns, and alas, you still see it in some of the contemporary worship songs, as though the, the, the main and only thing was that one day we'll die and then we'll go off to a better place and there we'll be resting or reigning or whatever. No. After death, according to the New Testament, I mean it's very serious, there's another little book, I don't know if I recommended it, but it's, it's um, just came out last year, called For All the Saints, question mark, in which I expand this a bit. After death, the promise is that we will be with Christ, which is far better, Philippians chapter 1. And I take that to be a conscious state, but it is a conscious temporary state because there will come a further stage, what I call life after life after death. People seem to find that very little with their, their heads around. It seems to be perfectly clear. Well, according, to, uh, according 
to Philippians 3, God will change our lowly body to be like the glorious body of Jesus. That has not happened yet to any single other person. Some traditions say something like that's happened to Mary. That's a totally non-biblical speculation. It has not happened to Peter, James, John, Paul, anyone. Paul says, first the Messiah, then at his coming, those who belong to him. When he makes new creation and gives us new bodies to share in it. Because you see, if you hold on simply to a hope of a kind of a vaguely disembodied heaven as the last stage, the final goal, that will play back into how you see Christian life in the present. It will generate, if you're not careful, it will generate a private interior spirituality which may be very powerful, may be very significant for where you are, but is Christianly incomplete. Because we are meant to be people who now worship God with our whole souls, with our bodies. Notice how in 1 Corinthians, the promise of resurrection at the end in 1 Corinthians 15 is actually the summing up of so much of the rest of the letter. God raised the Lord and will raise us by his power, therefore glorify God in your body now. What you do with your body matters because of what God is going to do to it and with it at the end. So the promise of the gospel is not simply going to heaven. You know, people quote back at me, um, in my father's house are many mansions or many rooms in John 14. Fine, okay, that is a promise of Jesus taking us to be with him where he is at the moment. But where he is at the moment is not yet complete until he makes the new heaven and the new earth. And likewise Jesus saying to the dying thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Yes, of course, that's important. But paradise in that scheme of thought is the blissful garden, the temporary resting place until the time when God does the new thing that he's going to do. So don't be deceived. The whole emphasis of the New Testament is thrusting forwards towards that time when God will make new heavens and new earth. And do you know that passage in 1 Peter as well? Again, people quote back at me and say that, that Peter talks about a salvation kept in heaven for you, who by faith are being kept for, for a salvation. So he said, there you are, we've got to go to heaven to get it. But that's not how the logic of that works at all. If I say, to a friend who's come to visit I say I've kept some beer in the fridge for you, it doesn't mean that he's got to go and get into the fridge to drink the beer <laughs> the uh, yes, with great respect to the Bishop of Dartmouth, he's in a muddle from our angle, some of that's dead right, some is dead wrong it's not that difficult there's no life after life after death there's simply life after death and life after death will be at the resurrection, which occurs when Jesus returns, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. So there's still a model, a CV model there for me. You don't need that extra complication of life after life after death. Life after death is enough, and life after death will happen when we're resurrected at the return of Christ to set up his kingdom upon a renewed earth. That's easy. So he's coming out of the model that, from our angle, hasn't come out of the model totally. But when he speaks of Greek philosophy being the, the bad thing, we're totally in agreement with that. Anyway, I thought you might not. So now let's look at the parable of the sower for the moment. If you haven't, haven't have a Bible, any translation will do. I agree with Frank that some of the translations are so paraphrased that they lose the text. But most Bibles, though, I think 98% is about right. In any translation, you'll get the idea of the kingdom of God, which is Jesus' main and central doctrine. That's unarguable. So we did Luke 4.43 yesterday. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom to the other cities also. That's why God commissioned me. That's a marvelous purpose statement. You know how good Americans are at purpose statements? Everybody has to have a list of priorities in America. In England we just muddle through and hope for the best. But in America you have your purpose statements. Well there's Jesus' purpose statement. A good refrigerator text. You pin this on your fridge. I must. I'm duty bound. I'm driven theologically to preach the gospel. All preaching in the Bible is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Always. That's what preaching means. You announce the kingdom. And so Jesus is announcing the kingdom of God to the other cities also. That's the reason why God commissioned me. Do we need an army of theologians to explain that? But you won't hear that text preached in public. Amazing. And that's why then Billy Graham, bless his heart, we should say, I suppose, not trying to be hard on anybody, says, in heaven you're going to polish rainbows, prepare heavenly dishes and tend heavenly gardens. 
And most Brits, like myself, are very bored by that idea. I don't polish anything on earth very well. Much less do I want to polish a rainbow in heaven. That's just nonsense, I think. No, you're going to rule the world. You're going to fix the world. You're going to be blessing the world on a grand scale. And so your Christianity is preparation for that. What sort of people should you be now if you're going to be the incorruptible government of the future? That makes good sense. Don't you know the saints are going to manage the world, 1 Corinthians 6 2. That gets my attention. But polishing rainbows, I don't think so. Playing a harp on a pink cloud, solo cloud, divorce from the rest of the harps on other clouds, it's a dismal prospect. And I think Frank said a lot of that's just nonsense. It's just wrong. Not trying to be hard on anybody, it's not biblical. Jesus was not a Platonist, but Plato said that you have an immortal soul that goes to heaven, disappears somehow, disembodied. And so then, why would you need the resurrection? Even Tyndale, who was burned at the stake for translating, well, not burned, but killed, I think, for translating the Bible into English so that every farmer could read it and so on. He said, why, Mr. Pope, would we need a resurrection if our souls have all gone to heaven? That's a good question. That was Frank's point, too. There's no point in riveting the soul back to the body if the soul has been enjoying bliss in heaven or being tortured under the earth, which is also wrong. Why do you need a resurrection? So the whole goal... The resurrection is lost if you think that when you die you go consciously on messes in heaven. And I hear people, even in Australia, talk about passing on and passing away. What is this? The Bible doesn't talk about passing away, it says you die, actually. Lazarus is, here's my Georgian, dead, right? Dead. Not passing on, not passing away. So, whoop, disappeared. No. He's dead. I think that's good conditionless language. Since our language maps out what we think, let's use the right terminology. Okay, with that in mind, then what is the heart of Jesus' salvation program? How does he do this? Jesus was a theologian. Most of your friends don't think of him as a theologian. They think he just came and died for you and rose. All of that's very important. But they don't think of Jesus as a preacher of the gospel mostly, do they? And so the, the talk that um, Steve gave yesterday was, was, a, was a wonderful point for me. Here's a conversation stopper for you across your coffee table at home. You say, what's the gospel? In America, they say, well, this is obvious. It's 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus died and was buried and rose again. Billy Graham says, Jesus came to do three days' work. Oh. Then what was he doing for 30 chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he wasn't talking about his death and resurrection at that stage? But he was preaching the gospel, right? Your friends have never thought of that. That's a marvelous question for directing the back. Because I, I take it that these conferences are exercising and training the troops. You know, we're all trying to encourage each other to deal with those six billion people out there who haven't much understanding of the New Testament. So you start with that. What's the gospel? It's a great question. We're just preparing a video now. You might have seen our JesusIsHuman.com free video at the website out there somewhere. We're doing something on the forgotten gospel where we go with the mic and talk to the public. So what's the gospel? And they all say, well, Jesus died and rose. Oh, then what was he doing preaching the gospel, the evangelion, as the modern Greeks pronounce it. I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation because it's a living language. What was he doing preaching the gospel and not at that stage saying anything about his death and resurrection? That must prove to the open-minded that there's more to the gospel than just Jesus died and rose important and vital as that is, clearly. That was the Abrahamic point in the 1850s. They said, my goodness, you know, there's more to the gospel than we're hearing in church. Now, with that in mind, then, if Jesus is a preacher of the kingdom of God, and by kingdom of God we mean essentially that kingdom is coming, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's easy. All of your friends know that one. Yes, there are plenty of repercussions, if you like, implications of the kingdom in the present, but essentially the kingdom in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is that future event dependent on the second coming. 98% of the kingdom texts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are future kingdom texts. They are. You can check it. Do an exercise on that. Then Jesus unpacks that kingdom message and he's claiming to be a purveyor of immortality. Is anybody interested in indestructible life? You get as old as I am. You are very interested in that because you may keel over at any stage and indestructible life sounds like a good idea. So I've, I've loved life at least for the last three days here, and much more. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Now life at its best is a lot of fun. There are many things we would love to do. Sam, you know, travel the world and marvel at the variety of creation. All these different people with their different accents and different ways of thinking. It's fascinating, isn't it? None of us really wants to die. Well, Jesus is claiming to be 
a purveyor of the immortality message, the immortality program. He's saying to the public, would you like to live forever? How about that? All right. He came to bring immortality to light through the gospel. That's what, 2 Timothy 1.10. He came to bring immortality, indestructible life, unending life, to light, to bring it clear to the public. That gets my attention. Of course, if you said to Jesus, what did your dad do in town, Jesus? You know, who's your dad? Well, Joseph was his legal father, certainly. But he would say, look here now, I'd say, well, God is my father. Wow. <laughs> How many people didn't have a physical father? That gets my attention. It's very unusual, isn't it? That's astonishing. I didn't hear this in church very clearly. So if he's a purveyor of the immortality message, then how does he do this? I would argue that he unpacks this process in the parable of the sower and all of his teaching, but essentially in the parable of the sower. We have to start with this. I want to say to you that the Word of God in, is not a synonym for the Bible in the New Testament mostly. Let me say that again. The phrase, Word of God, God, the Word of God, you, you hear it all the time, God, the Word of God. It's not wrong, but it's not quite right either. You've got the words of God, I think, in Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But within the words of God, you've got what's called the Word of God, the message, the Logos, which is 98% of the time in the New Testament, the Gospel about the Kingdom. So if you just use the Word of God all the time, a synonym for the Bible, you're losing information, you're confusing the core of the apple with the apple, you're confusing the bullseye with the target, with the bigger thing. It's a very subtle but rather devastating thing. Look, for instance, you're reading the book of Acts, and it says, next Sabbath, next Saturday, they all came to hear the word of God. They think, aha, oh, general lecture on the Bible. That's my George again, the Bible. The Bible, I better say for my British colleague here, because you think I've gone yank. <laughs> You'd be right. That's marvelous. Now, you will find what I just said to you in any Bible dictionary. I'll tell you, the academy is not a... It's a mixed blessing, but there's a lot in the academy that's very good. And to all who doubt that, who think that all scholars are fools, I want to say it's not entirely true. Those men that work in biblical languages all their lives are not idiots, most of them at all. They write the dictionaries and keep an eye on that because it's very easy to be a solo amateur getting in a muddle with words even. Now, for instance, if you didn't believe in aeroplanes, you wouldn't write a book full of what aeroplanes do. I'm throwing this, there's nothing really to do with what I'm saying, but if you didn't believe in demons, their mania, you wouldn't necessarily write a book full of demons, would you? It's a very easy question to consider. So, with that in mind, vocabulary and the meaning of the words is essential. And language is tricky. If I come to America and say I'm mad about my flat, I, of course, meant I'm thrilled about my new apartment. You understood that? In America, it means I'm very angry about my flat tire. I'm changing my tire on the side of the road and I'm furious about it, right? I'm out of mad about my flyer. <laughs> language is tricky, and the devil knows that, and he knows that we aren't very good la language-wise. People don't know much about language, especially in the West. We all assume that everybody speaks English. When Americans go to France and they, they speak English to the French, they just yell louder if they're not understood. <laughs> <laughs> the devil is, has only one trick, and that's to confuse us, to get us a muddle about words, isn't it? So watch language carefully. Jesus was not a 20th century Westerner. And when he said uh, kingdom of God, he meant what kingdom of God meant to a Jew at that time. And they knew. It's like the crown jewels or the Queen of England. They didn't have to argue about what that was. It meant when the Messiah rules the world. End of story. Easy. But the devil being clever enough says, I've got to muddle the word kingdom and I've got to muddle the word God. And he's done it very effectively. So you define your basic terms in every communication. Jane and John have just broken up. In England, that means it's the end of their school term. <laughs> True. I discovered that. I mean, when you're married to an American, you, you know, try to figure these things out, like a cookie and a biscuit, all of that stuff. Language is tricky. And the devil has one essential trick, and that is to separate Jesus from his teachings. You can go on talking about ye Jesus all day long, but if you don't identify him by his language, I mean, if I came up here and just smiled, you know, and said nothing, you wouldn't know a lot about who we are. Isn't that true? So the devil has one major trick. That's to separate Jesus from his teachings. And so Luther says, and this is why the Reformation is partial, Luther says, if you never read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you aren't missing much. John is to be highly treasured, says Luther, above all the Gospels. 
Oh, I don't read that in scripture. John is marvelous. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke is where it's at. And as we'll do, we'll do the parable of the sower. Three corroborating accounts of the teachings of Messiah. Isn't that right? And then you remember Second John where it says, if anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the teachings of Jesus, watch out. You're in trouble. You're being deceived. If anybody comes and brings another gospel, another spirit, and another Jesus, essentially, that's the devil masquerading as an angel of light. And Paul said to the Corinthians, you're putting up with it, didn't he? They were all nodding. See, the false prophet came along and, and they all nodded. Paul says, you're putting up with that. So we have them to be discerning in some way. So, starting with the parable of the sower, do we know where that is? Most people don't know where that is. And I don't hold that against you at all, but... Mark 4 and... Matthew 13 and... Luke 8. Those are John 3.16s, right? Everybody knows John 3.16. God loved the world in this way. That he gave his uniquely begotten son. So that everybody who believes him or believes in him, it's the same thing. You've got to believe what he says and believe in him. And that's the way we establish trust among ourselves, by the way. And Paul tells me he's so and so years old or lives in wherever. And so I think you're lying, Paul. No. Normally we trust each other. If you're the God of the universe, you expect to be believed. And so you know the text about Abraham. Abraham believed God in Genesis 15:6. He believed what God said. And that was reckoned to him as making him right rather than wrong. We have all these jargon words like justification, which you argue about all that. It's very complicated in the books. No, he believed what God said. It's like Zechariah didn't, right? What happened to him? Got struck, struck dumb for nine months for not believing what the angel said. So, caution there, right? You're supposed to believe what God says and act it up, act on it, of course. So with that in mind, we're supposed to believe the words of Jesus. That's 1 Timothy 6.3 where it says that the words of Messiah are health-giving, hygienic words. They're going to do you good and make you feel better, spiritually and physically. 1 Timothy 6.3. Paul is very rude there in quotes. He says, uh, if somebody comes to you and doesn't bring the health-giving words, the sound-giving, uh, health-giving words of Jesus, he's an ignorant, knows nothing. So the words of Jesus are what it's all about, clearly. With that in mind, then, the parable of the sower. Mark, uh, Mark 4, Matthew 13, Luke 8. You've got three chances of getting it right. And by comparing them, you see how they complement each other in a beautiful way. So should we start in Luke 8? won't read all of this, but because time is limited. But I do commend this to you. Uh, we did a chapters on this in that little book over there. I think it's called The Aims and Claims, Amazing Aims and Claims of Jesus, because this really strikes me as interesting material. And I think as a sort of inquiring person, I would have been on the beach there, listening carefully to this Messiah who got in a boat and using the echo effects across the water, spoke to a crowd of who knows how many on the beach, right? And I will refer to, to the parallel passages in Mark 4 and Matthew 13. In Mark 4 it says, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of them. That's interesting. So this parable of the sower is about parables. In general, too. It's, it's, the, it's the great parable. What's a parable? It's a comparison. Life is like a bowl of cherries. Why am I in the pit? You know? <laughs> Have we got any other parables? Can you give me any more? Life is like a what? I, I want to collect some good ones. Oh, a box of chocolate. <laughs> a box of chocolate. Yeah. Life is like a box of whatever. It's a comparison. Because we're not very smart theologically, but we understand a box of chocolates and a bowl of cherries. And Jesus knew that. He didn't expect the public to be sophisticated theologically and use long words like circumcision and so on and so on. He doesn't expect that. He doesn't need that. And he knows that even uncountrified boys like myself, as sort of a town person, are not good on the way things grow. Until, since my wife's a master gardener, I've learned some things in the last five years, ten years. We live on 35 acres of Georgia forest. And it suddenly has struck me in my latter years, it's amazing. You put a seed in the ground and it produces... Where does that come from? Now, you're all seeds, aren't you? There's nobody in this room who doesn't understand what a seed does. And Jesus knew that, so he said, let's think about the immortality program in terms of seeds. And so he's really saying to the public, here's the elixir of life. Would you like to have the, the pill that will give you eternal life, if you like? And he says, it's like sowing. And Frank was mentioning planting. The Old Testament is full of, I'm going to plant my people. Of course. 
It's the same idea. I'm going to seed them. And even Dawkins, the atheist, says, there isn't a God, but maybe there was an alien who seeded life on the earth. Isn't that amazing? I, I like that to use the word seed. That's, that's my word here. The Greek word for seed is spora, which you learned in biology, didn't you? Or sperma, you know what that is. And the Greeks talked about this logos spermaticos, the seed-giving word. They recognized there was some creative, uni uh, creative activity in the universe holding it together. They called it the Logos Spermaticos. And guess what? The Messiah goes around preaching and sowing the Logos. Isn't that right? So the New Testament is saying our Messiah knows better than those philosophers. He'll tell you the real secret to immortality. And these are the very words that even Greeks would have understood, like Logos meaning word. Right? So back to my point about the word of God being not a synonym for the Bible, mostly in the New Testament, uh, simply, you can look it up, check it out in any Bible dictionary, or go, and I'll refer to these texts for the sake of time, in Acts 8, marvelous chapter, in Acts 8, it says that Philip preached Christ. What does that mean? He got up there and said, Christ? 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 I don't think so. And then in the next verse it says he preached the Word. So he went up there and said, Word? Word now. Ask your friends what that means. What was that message? That's what I want to know. Well, Luke, being a brilliant writer and writing more of the New Testament, if you exclude Hebrews, more of the New Testament than any other writer, brilliant, probably a Gentile, I would like to think he's a Gentile, at least. He writes before the cross and after the cross, doesn't he? That's amazing. And here's, you must do the kingdom exercise. You do the kingdom in Luke and then you go to the kingdom in Acts. Eight texts, kingdom texts in Acts. Have you done them with your friends recently? You must do them. The eight kingdom texts in Acts to show that the kingdom of God gospel went on after the cross. Anyway, down in Acts 8.12, in view of the fact we've had preaching the Word and preaching Christ, we have a definition in Acts 8.12. And it says, when they believe Philip, get that right, when they believe what he said, they actually said, yes, I think you're right, I believe it. When they believe Philip, preaching the gospel about the KG, kingdom of God, of course, then they were getting baptized in perfect tense. You can see them lining up. They were getting baptized, both men and women. Isn't that brilliant? That's an early creed. It should be out there in the public all the time. It isn't. It's an easy thing. See, I, love, I love easy things. You can't argue. I'm tired of arguments. It's very easy. When they believe, in the, in the, my friends the CDs, the Christian Elvis know that text. And we Abrahamics know that text. Too. Again, when they believe Philip, they say, Philip, I think you're right. I think this is right. I think God is speaking through. I think this is great. I believe it. I want to be baptized. It wasn't years of uh, catechizing, I don't think. I think they got the general idea of who God was and Jesus was, very clear. And the kingdom of God, and I go for it. Pure sexual life, sexual purity, very important. Straight life. You want to have a glass of wine sometimes, fine. If you don't, that's fine. If you eat shrimp occasionally, that's not going to kill you either. Because the law of Moses is not the Torah, I say with great caution, is not exactly the same as the Torah of Messiah. There's a new covenant too, but that's another sign. So it's a simplicity in Christ, belief in the kingdom, in God and Jesus, and the straight line, clearly. So that word then means the word of the kingdom. And I'll show you that now in the parable of Let's go to Luke 8, where it says, Soon afterwards, 8 1 says, He began going around from one city. Remember, he, he said, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom to the other cities also. That's the reason for which I was sent, Luke 4 43. So there he is, traipsing around as an itinerant preacher of the kingdom of God, the KH or the KG. Same thing. The devil said the KH is different from the KG, mass confusion. Same thing. What was he doing? Proclaiming, that's the heralding word. Kirisin in Greek means to get a trumpet and blow it loud and say, y'all listen, because this is immortality, don't miss this. You've got to listen to Messiah, heralding and preaching, that's the evangelizome word, to evangelize as gospel the kingdom of God. Luke loved the kingdom, he was obsessed with the kingdom. Jesus was obsessed with the kingdom. And if your friends don't talk about the kingdom, they don't sound like Jesus. If they keep saying, well, when I die, I go to hell. You don't sound like Jesus. So the bracelet should say, what would Jesus say? Not only what would he do. See, we're reducing it to ethics. What would he do? Well, he'd be a nice chap and pat you on the head. And isn't, you know, that's good too, in some way. But what would Jesus think and say? So kingdom of God is the language of Jesus. And that is then to recognize, I think, in kingdom of God preachers, something of the spirit of Jesus here. The twelve were with him, so his executive trainees were with him, right? You want your mission to continue after you die, you get your brilliant young ones, and they traipse around behind you, uh, 
behind Jesus in this case. And I'm happy to tell the women, there were women who had been healed of demonic spirits here, and sicknesses too, two different categories, please note, two different categories, from demonic spirits and diseases, of course. Mary, Mariam, Miriam in the Old Testament, the one called Magdalene, and seven demons had gone out of her. I didn't intend to read this, by the way, but that's interesting. And Joanna and so on. And many other women. Did you notice it? Many other women. Your English doesn't tell you that, does it? Greek there is feminine. Many other women who are contributing to the mission out of their own pocket. That's marvelous. Women are very important in the New Testament. They're the first ones to see the resurrection. What a privilege. I don't think God, I don't think Paul ordained them as well as by the way. I think that Paul did not want to burden the women with where the buck stops in the local church. That's another question. But the women were fully supportive of what Jesus was doing. And then, when a large crowd was coming together from various cities, journeying to him, he spoke to them by way of a parable. A comparison life is like a box of chocolates, right? A comparison. And he says then the sower goes out to sow his spora, sperma. I see. We're all doing that all the time, aren't we? Don't we lobby each other? When we talk to each other, we sow seeds of ideas all the time. We're doing it. Well, Jesus is doing that. He's trying to get an idea into the hearts of these people, isn't it? Clearly. Jesus is a terrific persuader, and so was Paul. He actually argued in the synagogue. It's not wrong to argue, as long as it doesn't end in a fist fight. You know, that's not the same thing. So the sower is sowing his seed, his sperma. Of course, the seed is a reflection of your own heart. You're reproducing yourself now, aren't you? <laughs> he's asking people to copy him, because he's giving out his mind and trying to plant it in our minds. And you know the story, you won't read all this. Some of the seed goes in temporarily, doesn't it? It falls by the wayside. It's in one ear and out the other. Yes, they hear it, now they go back to life out there and it's gone. Now that doesn't sound like the doctrine of once saved, always saved, when we get to the next one, because Luke, and I'll refer to the Luke passage, no, it's right here, Luke 8, 11. We've got it, the explanation here. The parable is this, the seed is the word of God. I see. That's the word of the kingdom. The parallel is Matthew 13, 19. says it's the word about the kingdom of God. That's clear. So when you're reading word, 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 you're reading word of the kingdom, word of the kingdom. If you don't get that vocabulary straight, very difficult to follow the story. So you mark in your margin, because all of you are going to be teachers, teaching these people in some way. You mark in your margin against Luke 8, 11, uh, Matthew 13, 19. It defines it as the word about the kingdom. I see. The seed is the word of the kingdom. I need that seed. That's what we need, is the seed of the kingdom. And then he says in verse 12, those beside the road are those who have heard. So you've got to hear this thing, first of all. Then the, the avalos, the devil, the devil that needs no explanation because they knew what that was, the devil comes. You can see now what the devil is trying to do. That's very instructive. You see what the devil is trying to do, then you can see the opposite of what Jesus is doing. The devil comes and snatches away that logos, that word of the kingdom, from their heart, which is the seed of understanding in the Bible. No dichotomy, no Western dichotomy between your emotions and your... Sorry, your emotions here and your head here. No, you think with your heart in the Bible. It's the center of your operation, is your heart. Very much an intellectual word. So the devil knows that. He's trying to get rid of that seed then from the heart. And now look what it says in verse 12. So that they will not believe this message of the kingdom and what? Be incredible. That is a power-packed verse. The whole of the theology of Jesus is piled into that innocent little statement. So it's all about hearing the seed of the kingdom. It's all about watching that the devil doesn't take that away from your heart. Because if he takes it away from your heart, you're not going to be saved. Am I right? That's what it seems to say. That's shattering. It's shatteringly interesting how that works. And in Luke 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they receive the word, they heard it, they received it, yeah, the receiver is open, they're getting the message. Now what happens? They have no firm root. They believe for a while. That doesn't sound like what I heard in the evangelistic, evangelical church. Well, the idea seems to be that if you go forward and put up your hand to get saved, 
It wouldn't matter if you robbed the bank for every week of the rest of your life, you'd still go to heaven. That's what they seem to say. That's got to be wrong. Isn't it? These people believed for a while, but it didn't last. And so you can say, well, if you saw a water slide, with kids coming down a water slide, and one of them falls off in the middle and never gets to the bottom, you wouldn't say, well, he was never on it in the first place, would you? And that's what they say. Well, he wasn't really saved. That's not what Jesus said. They did believe. Yes, they were believers, temporarily. And then other things crept in, like the troubles of life and the finances. And it choked the word, and it didn't produce any fruit. It was really neat to see, I think, the spirit moving when Frank was... was doing that psalm about fruit and soil and planting. You, you, you did it, whatever that is, 90 second psalm. It's all about planting seed because it's all about bearing fruit and we all know about the fruits of the Spirit but nobody knows what the seed is that produce them. Well, I'd say nobody knows. It's, it's rather obscure. So if you want fruit in your church, you might try sowing the seed. It's not going to telling you we've got to be more loving. It's okay to do that. You're going to do this and don't do that and make sure you're faithful. Well, well if they haven't got the seed there, they're not going to produce that fruit. So the fruit of the Spirit then would be based presumably on this seed. And the rest of the story then is clear to you in verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones we've heard, always have to hear the message of the kingdom, the message, the logos of the Vasilia, the message of the kingdom. And they go on their way and they're choked with worries and mortgages and family problems and the rest of it. It speaks to us all, doesn't it? And this loses focus and they sort of fall away. But, 15, the seed on the good soil, those are the ones who've heard the word, and you say, word of the kingdom, always supply, word of the king, not just any old word. And they hear the word in an honest, there is such a thing as an honest person here. An honest, what was it he said about Nathaniel? There's an Israelite without any guile, right? Honest heart. So you pray to have an honest and genuine heart and you take that message in and you cling on to it. You hold it fast. Grip it. Hold it to yourself as though your life depends on it because it does. And you bear fruit with perseverance. Isn't that power packed stuff? It's amazing stuff to me. Absolutely devastating. I like the rabbi Messiah here. It's an extraordinary story. Now then people say, well, yes, that's Jesus' teaching, but you know, Paul didn't worry about any of that, did he? And John, no, did they talk about the parable of the soul? So, you know, what's that about? And so you say to your friends, let me ask you this question. Did John ever use the word gospel? John wrote the gospel of John and three letters. Did he ever use the word gospel? What's the answer to that, though? The answer is no. Oh, poor old John. Never understood the gospel. Never used the word gospel. All right, did John ever use the word faith? That's pistis in Greek. Faith. Actually, once in his epistles. Hmm. Did he believe in faith? All right, did John ever use the word repentance? No. I thought he didn't believe in prophet I'm silly, isn't it? Ah, the key is that these different writers are using different words to explain the same thing. Right. I might say automobile, I don't, but uh, you, you, you know, in England, car, in America, automobile. So the person who ever says automobile doesn't believe in cars? It's silly. The public doesn't know this. You've got to see the different language forms in the different writers with the, which are synonymous in meaning. So, of course, John believed in faith. He uses the verb to believe. Same thing, faith, belief, believing. And of course John believed in repentance. And of course he believed in the gospel, but he used a different word like testimony. It's a divine statement, a sort of a legal term on uh, God is making a, a divine statement to us, his testimony. So that's easy. Now let me show you briefly in, in the moments that remain then, that these other writers did this parable of the sower thing. They all did it. All the apostles, as I see it, are doing the immortality package. They're offering the public the Im immortality sower message, I think. Okay, then you ask your friends this. Uh, did Matthew and Mark and Luke ever mention born again? No. Amazing. In John's Gospel, Jesus is reported saying, unless you're born again, you ain't gone nowhere. Is that right? You haven't gone off square one. You've got to be born again. But Matthew and Mark and Luke didn't even get hold of that, so they didn't even mention it. That's crazy. I want to suggest to you that 
born again is equivalent to what Jesus is doing with the soul here. The seed is the seed of life. And whether you use the farmer analogy or the, perhaps the more sophistic, sophisticated one about being born again to Nicodemus, it comes to the same thing. And I'll, I'll finish in a second by showing you that Peter brought it all together. So yes, born again, sowing the seed, it's the same idea. You've got to have new life from the seed and by being born of the Spirit. So the words that I speak to you, Jesus said, are spirit and life. They're spirit and life imparting, John 6, 63. And some people use the word spirit more and others use the word words. They're very closely connected. It's very difficult to separate spirit from word. Because again, John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit giving words. They're life imparting words. And so when Peter says, you know, we're, we're about to leave because you're getting too difficult for us. And Jesus says, are you going to leave too, the rest of them? Well, no, we won't leave because you have the words of life. Spirit, words. So the devil is very clever at separating word from spirit, by the way. And you can have spirits of all sorts. That's why you have to test the spirits to see what they say about Jesus, right, in 1 John 4. Because there are lots of false spirits out there. The test is, what, who do they say about Jesus? That's Frank's point. Who do they say about the Son of God? What do they say about the Son of God? You have to test the spirits, clearly, because spirit is, is imitable, copyable. It can be uh, masquerading under the guise of the Spirit of God, clearly. I see that. Okay, so now very briefly, the other writers, did they bother with the, the soul? I think they did. For instance, go and ask yourself this question. Did anybody else speak about being born again in the New Testament besides John? Yes, absolutely. Anybody else? Yes. In Galatians 4, let's give you the verses. Galatians 4, he talks about Isaac, you know, the two sons, the fleshly son and the spiritual son. And he speaks about the true people of God as being the born again ones. And the fleshly ones persecuted the born again ones. That's in Galatians chapter 4, verses 23, 28 and 29. When you turn to it, you see that Paul used the phrase born again. That's wonderful. As Jesus did in John 3. Now did John use, did John say anything about the seed? The Apostle John. Well, yes, he did in 1 John 3, 8. This is a fun study to put together, by the way. It's, it's a lot of fun just r running through these verses. In 1 John 3, 8, you have this. The one who practices sin, who practices sin. No, nobody's sinless this side of the resurrection, I think. But if you're out there committing adultery, you know, every week, or getting drunk every night, you're practicing sin, and you'll, you'll get nowhere fast. Yes, we sin. If any man sins, we have to be forgiven. I see that. But John says here, the one who practices sin is of the devil. It's important to understand the devil, because it's a key term. Is of the devil. It's, it has its source somehow in the devil. Because the devil sinned from the beginning. He's the ancient serpent, as you know, from the story. So it's in from the beginning. But the Son of God appeared for this purpose. That's another Luke 4.43. I came to preach the gospel, right? I came to do this. Now what else did he appear to do? He appeared to destroy the works of the devil. To ruin the works of the devil. That's why he came. Now, now verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin. If you're born of God, you're not going to be out there rob robbing a bank every day. That's just ridiculous. It will prove you weren't born of God. Because the seed abides in him. Doesn't that sound very much like the parable of the soul? The seed of the message of the kingdom is rooted in itself, which is somehow God's DNA. The transmission of divine life to you from God the Father, through Jesus. You need that seed. You need that elixir. And it's like a, I don't know if you do this in Australia, but we have the battery, what's that battery thing, you put a strap on your back, the energizer battery. You have that in Australia? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You need the energy of the Word of God strapped on your back, and it's the seed of the message of the kingdom. A good text to go with this is 1 Thessalonians 2.13, which says, that, where Paul says, you accepted the message of the kingdom, which is energite in you. You hear the word? Energite. It's energizing you. Why? Because it's the life of creation transmitted to you. And if you were the devil, what would you do? You'd want to get rid of that seed, wouldn't you? But you'd want to go on preaching Jesus. Oh, God is wonderful, and Jesus is wonderful. Yeah, but you've never heard what Jesus preached. That would be the devil's technique, presumably. All right, now we bring this to a close like this. Or we might just do Titus 3.5. That talks about regeneration, that's born again. Titus says, you are born again, regenerated through the washing of the word, that sort of language in Titus 3.5. That's Paul writing to Titus. 
And of course, Paul would, I think, in our day, use repeat his statement in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where he says, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one faith. That's the starting point, though. That's how it starts. By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. That's the ground. That's the kickoff point. So Titus then talks about regeneration. That's born again, same as John 3, right? It's the same idea. And now pulling it all together, here's how it goes. Oh, we might do 1 Corinthians 4.15. Let's do that one. 1 Corinthians 4.15. How many minutes do I have now, Paul, please? How many? Fourteen minutes? Okay, that's good. No, no, fourteen. Fourteen, I heard that. Fourteen. Okay. First Corinthians 4.15 says, If you were to have countless tutors in Messiah, yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ, Paul says, I became your father. I begat you again. I got you started spiritually. That's what Paul said. So there's the begetting idea. Beget is a foggy word for people, but it means to become the father of. And if we had time, I'd love to do Luke 135, which says, that which is begotten in Mary, or that which she's begetting, is from Holy Spirit, meaning that Son of God was divinely created, procreated. So there's another born-again one. But pulling it all together, we go to Peter. Peter, who was number one apostle in some sense, a certain primacy of Peter, I don't think the Pope, it's quite right to say that he's a successor of Peter, that sounds odd, because the Pope doesn't sound much like Peter, because he's not married, and Peter was, and other things. But he doesn't sound like Peter, and therefore I'm sceptical of the idea that he would be Peter's direct successor. We don't have apostles like that, we don't have a succession of apostles anyway. If we did, if we knew that Paul here was the apostle, we'd all have to go and do exactly what Paul says. That would be good. It would be wonderful. Whatever. I don't think God makes it that difficult. Now, there are six, two witnesses. You know there are two witnesses in the Bible in the future who have supernatural powers big time. But there are already six of them. There are two in Australia and two, two in America. I've seen more wackoism in religion. Believe me, I've seen, I think I've seen a lot in 50 years of doing this. There's some wacko stuff. I've been there. I'm probably pretty wacko now. I've seen incredible stuff. Amazing stuff. It's very dangerous. It's a minefield out there. But if you get back to the simple things like who God is, who Jesus is, what's the gospel, go for it, straight life, that's it. But to argue about the calendar, or to argue about shrimp or not shrimp, from my angle, is an absolute waste of time. And the devil is a great diverter. We can get you arguing about this, that, and the other, how long your sleeves can be. Marvelous waste of time. Burns up your energy. And you never get to the point. It's, it's very clever. Isn't that how you divert people? Say, look over here. This is called misdirection country, right? Up here. <laughs> clever. The devil is a trick master. That's what Paul said. Beware of the methodias, the schemes of the devil. He's very clever. He watches us and says, these people are really very gullible. I'll just send them a powerful preacher and they'll all be nodding. And you've got 23 million people following Ellen G. White who had a vision about the Sabbath lit up. And so 23 million of them now, did that give them a good understanding? Because we used to study this text, a good understanding have all those who do the commandments, we said. Oh, well, here they are keeping the Sabbath faithfully, and they've just written the most ridiculous book on the Trinity I've ever seen. They are without understanding, I really. Their Sabbath keeping hasn't helped them a lot. And that, here are the people who recently said that Echad, one, that Frank sings, so, and by the way, that sings marvelous, wonderful. The word echad, say the SDAs, is essentially a plural word. Hmm. That's amazing. How do you get away with saying that when you've got the DD after your name? That's the power of deception. How do you get a billion Roman Catholics to believe that Mary's up there, that God came to Mary and said, Mary, will you please be my mother? And they're all nodding. <laughs> How do you get Jim Packer to say that the baby was cooing and upholding the universe at the same time? How do you get 23 million SDAs to believe that Ellen White, who had a vision, quote, and they're all following her. That's amazing. It suggests that the power of religion is deceptive, doesn't it? Now you point that to yourself and say, where am I deceived? I mean, that couldn't help to happen to my group, could it? We have to turn the spotlight to ourselves and say, could we be wrong in some areas? Is it, is it conceivable that we might be wrong? 
Uh, that's the art of the game. And so you do what I mentioned last night, the Dival Prayer. I was thinking maybe St. Dival Prayer. I don't think we'd better say that. <laughs> Some Dival's Prayer will be posted on your wall. Oh God, if I'm deceived, please undeceive me. You got that? I want you to take that home and pray it from time to time. If I've been scammed, please help me to get it straight. That's all you can do, actually. So here we're going to finish them with Peter. We've got ten minutes now. Same minute. Ten minutes. Five. Five minutes. Five minutes. That's it. Time is rushing right. We have to wind this up. First Peter. First Peter. In fact, uh, I know about this. If we do conferences like this, it's every year for eighteen years. And one man came, and he was going to. Be, he was so filled with the spirit that when we said you only have ten minutes to go, he said, "You're quenching the spirit. I'm going to go on." <laughs> There's no answer to that. God told me, the Spirit said, what can you do? <laughs> but often the Spirit that speaks to you is not the Spirit of God, it's, a, it's a, an illusion. If, for example, you know the names of people before they tell you, watch out. I heard that just the other day. Somebody said, I know your name before you even tell me. Well, I heard that in Kenya from a psychic. That scares me. Test the spirits. Is this the Spirit of God that did this? It may be, but you have to be careful. Of course, the opposite extreme says spirit does nothing, right? That's the opposite extreme. <laughs> this is a tricky business, a minefield. Anyway, we get to Peter, because we mustn't get diversity here. James and Peter. Peter has some sort of primacy. He's number one in the, in the list of apostles. And I think he knew what he was talking about, because he walked around with Jesus and understood this very well. But this brings it together so beautifully. First Peter 1, 22, finished with this. What we're doing is combining the parable of the soul with the John 3, born again, Stuff, the regeneration stuff. Now, here's what you did. According to the parable of the soul, you did shurf, S-H-U-R-F, seeing, hearing, understanding, repenting, and being forgiven, in that order. You've got to see. You've got to have your mind open to the message of the kingdom. You hear it. You understand it. Shurf, S-H-U-R-F. You understand it. You've got to understand it. Matthew in particular is heavy on the understanding of it. You've got to grasp this thing. And then you can repent. We didn't have time to read Mark 4. It says, if they don't hear and understand the message of the kingdom, they cannot repent and be forgiven. Shattering text. I recommend that as a refrigerator verse. Mark 4, 11. Shattering. You've got to have some intelligent understanding of the kingdom in order to repent. That makes sense because Adam fell from glory, and so restoration is to get the glory of the kingdom back in your face, the light that Frank was talking about. And people say, no, well, repent doesn't mean I'm going to give up adultery and drunkenness. Well, that's fine too. Give that up too. But they made up their own definition of repentance, and Jesus says repentance is getting back to the kingdom message, doesn't it? Mark 4, 11 and 12. Anyway, right, winding it up here, 1 Peter 1, 22. Since you, in obedience to the truth, the truth is another synonym for the gospel, in obedience to the gospel of the kingdom message as preached by Jesus and all the apostles, you obeyed it. You said, yes, I believe it, I'm going to do it. You then purified your souls by doing that, yourselves. Soul, you know, in the Bible means self. We've got 50 souls here, right? Not immortal souls floating around. We've got 50 souls here. You purified your soul. That's interesting because John said something about, Jesus said something about, you are pure through the word, aha, the word that I swear, I see. Katharos, cathartic. You've been cleansed when you get this message of the kingdom in your heart. So you got cleansed. And that led then to a genuine love for the, oh, I see. The genuine love came out of this process of accepting the message of the seed. That's producing love, because in Colossians 1, 4 it says, your love is based on your hope and your faith. A very unpopular text. Colossians 1, 4, let's throw that in. Because of your hope, you're producing love and faith. That's amazing. The commentators are at great loss to know what to do with that one. Anyway, because uh, you've, got, you've got sincere love for the brethren. We used to sing, and the only thing I remember from my charterhouse background, my private school background, singing in the choir, we sang, Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Greg has given me an opportunity to sing in public. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we say, I remember that. And the song, of course, is wonderful. That's implanted in my heart even this 70 years later, or whatever, 50 years later. That's amazing. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Straight out of here. That's what Peter said. The love came then from the seed. So then, get busy in love, right? Love sincerely and firmly from the heart. Four, now he explains it. That little Greek word, G-A-R, G -A -R, means this is what I mean by what I've just said. Four, F-O-R. My students mock that. You know, <laughs> it's Greek word meaning four. He explains what he means. 
for you have been born again, I see, regenerated. How did that happen? Not from seed which is perishable, seed, now we're pulling the, the sower together with the born again thing, but with incorruptible seed, should we say the seed of immortality, you've been rebirthed, born again. That is through, now it explains it again, through the living and enduring word of God. I see, not just the Bible, right? Not just the Bible, the word of the message of the kingdom, which is the heart, the core of the apple, the point in the center of the target. That's how you got it done. And he's going to explain that finally here. Then he says, well, look at the, all the grass that fades and the flowers that fall apart. That's the negative side. And we'll finish with this verse, 25. But the word of the Lord, that's God's logos, his creative activity, endures forever. And that word is what? The gospel that was preached to you. It says in our translations, was simply preached to you, but it's, it's a gospel word, right? Which was preached to you as gospel. Isn't that amazing? So Peter draws all of these strands together to combine the born again with the seed, the regeneration, and that's the source then of the love that is supposed to be produced in the church. Now, that may be entirely wrong. You check it out. Don't believe a word the preachers say. You always check it out, right? But that makes a lot of sense to me. That unites then all the apostles in one group as being immortality kingdom people. They're all going around telling the public, you want to live forever? Listen to what we have to say. That's what they say. You've got to get that seed. You've got to then find it to be like Abraham. And the great, great truth of the Bible is, God, why not? The land promise made to Abraham becomes the kingdom of God promise in the new. doesn't matter whether you say, blessed are the meek they're going to inherit the earth, or the land, or the kingdom. It's the same thing. The land promise made to Abraham, and so going to heaven is very distracting, and how do you get there? You get the seed that creates the new life, the seed of immortality, and you prepare them to rule with Christ in his coming kingdom on the earth when he returns. That's as much as I know as of today. Thank you.